Are you tired of not being able to hear yourself on stage? Are you a smaller independent artist that makes music that has a lot of layers, yet can't exactly afford the band to reproduce that live? Are you looking for something so durable, so affordable, and so easy to use that it'll make your overall gigging experience better for times to come? Well, look no further, this video is for you. My name is TJ Viola, and today I'm gonna to show you how I play with a three-piece band live using a backing track rig with in-ear monitors. This is a Gator G-Tor 4U. It is a four unit rack space made out of wood and metal casing. It retails for about $330 at Sweetwater, and it is extremely durable. I take this thing pretty much everywhere I go to most gigs that I play. And if you can tell by the JetBlue sticker on top, I have also taken this thing on flights and it has stood the test of time. This is an extremely durable rack space and they also make them in smaller sizes just in case you don't happen to need the four units provided. Now there are three pieces of gear that are essential to building one of these IEM backing track rigs. A power conditioner, which is what you're gonna use to power all the gear inside the rack and it's gonna protect all the gear from power surges and ground issues. An in-ear monitor system of your choice and an interface of your choice. It doesn't matter how many inputs, but you are gonna to need to make sure that it has at least four outputs, and I will explain why later in the video. The interface that I am using is the Focusrite Scarlett 18i20, which runs for about $500 on Sweetwater. It has 10 outputs total, and although it is rack mountable, as you can see here, it does add quite a bit of noticeable weight to the rack when you're carrying it. This is why I actually recommend something much lighter, such as the Scarlett 4i4, which has exactly four outputs. It runs for about $280 on Sweetwater, and it can fit in a small bag. The power conditioner that I'm using is the Livewire PC900. You can find these in pretty much any music store, and they run for about $80. They have nine outlets, including this one in the front, and they're super cheap, and they get the job done. The in-ear monitor system that I use is the Phoenix Pro PTM22 dual transmitter unit. Now, I just want to take a second to say, first of all, I'm not being sponsored by Phoenix Pro. I do not have enough good things to say about this brand that describes how good it is. I have used this system at several different venues for several different gigs in several different states from everywhere to bars, casinos, convention centers, different types of festivals. I've taken the system outside. I can confidently say that the signal of the Phoenix Pro system extends for hundreds of feet before giving out. As a keyboard player who plays a guitar, I like to be completely wireless so I can roam not only just around the stage, but also in the audience when I feel necessary. And just for reference, I've never had it give out once on a gig. And not only that, but the sound quality will also retain no matter how close or far you are from the system. It is very much comparable to the higher end in-ear monitor systems out there by Shure and Sennheiser, which I have both used before on gigs. On top of that, it is extremely affordable too. I recommend this system to anybody, especially smaller artists and gigging musicians who are on smaller scenes that want to use in-ears, but don't necessarily want to break the bank. Now this is a two transmitter system, so I can actually send two signals to two XLR outputs on pretty much any standard board, and I can run two different mixes to my band members depending on how many packs I have. This particular bundle actually comes with four body packs, so I can run multiple different combinations of the two transmitters through the four body packs for my band members. Most high-end in-ear systems will run you about $800 upwards to $1,000 and more, while the PTM22 only costs, and I have the price here right in front of me, $365.89 on Amazon. Oh, and by the way, you can get this system on Amazon because they're a dealer for this system and all Phoenix Pro products. You can also, of course, purchase their products on their website. Now, the way that I use this system with my three-piece band is I actually take my own personal mix and my bass player and drummer share a mix. So they agree on the mix beforehand and then I create my own mix just to make sure I'm hearing everything correctly to my standard. 
This system also comes with rack mounts so that you can actually attach it to a rack unit like this one. And also if you notice on the rack mounts, there are front antenna mounts so that you don't actually have to reach into the back of the rack to attach the antennas. You can actually put them on the front, which makes them more accessible to both take on and off. So that's my little rig rundown for this rack that I've built. Now I'm gonna show you all the accessories that you're going to need to make this system work in a live setting. Just wanna give a little disclaimer. This configuration is going to make it seem like you're bringing your own wedge to the gig. And because of that, not every venue is going to be able to accommodate you with the materials to make this system work. So that being said, you're going to need three DI boxes, five XLR cables, three unshielded and two shielded, two quarter inch to XLR female adapters, two quarter inch to XLR male adapters, three short quarter inch cables. You can also get longer ones depending on how far away the unit will be from the snake. And last but not least, in-ear monitors. And just in case you run out of packs for your band, get one of these headphone extenders for your drummer or any stationary band member on stage. Start by plugging in the three unshielded XLR cables to the DI boxes. The first two will be used for your backing tracks in stereo, and the third one will be used for the click in mono. Depending on the situation of the venue, these will go into the snake on stage, or they will go directly into the inputs of the console. Next, you want to plug the quarter inches in their respective outputs on the interface. So outputs one and two will be used as left and right for the backing tracks, and output three will be used for the click. Now for the in-ears, clip the quarter inch to XLR female adapters to the male ends of the shielded cables. These will go into the left inputs of both transmitters. The other ends of these cables will go into the outputs of the board, which will either be on the snake or directly on the console itself. And in the case that the venue's console doesn't use XLR outputs, then you can clip the quarter inch to XLR male adapters to the other ends and use those. In the event that you have to use the headphone extender, you can plug it into the output of the respective transmitter depending on what mix that musician wants to hear. After all this, you can start setting up your laptop, plugging in the hard drive, the interface, the charger, etc. And then you can start preparing the session for the show. Most people prefer to run Mainstage or Ableton. I actually run my backing tracks using Logic Pro. I find that it works really well, especially since I have the session stored on a hard drive and I'm only running one or two tracks at a time. Once that's set up, plug in the rack and turn everything on and now it's all set up for the show. To adjust the volume of the backing tracks, turn up the monitor knob on your interface as you would with a pair of studio monitors. I recommend starting at 12 o'clock and then going to 3 o'clock if they're not loud enough in the house. All you have to do now is plug in your pack and then you're ready to perform. Alright, so a bit of a location change. I'm now at the desk that I mix everything at, my music and everything. And right in front of me, I actually have the Logic Session that I use for my backing tracks when I play live. So I'm just going to give you a little rundown of how this works, how everything's routed, etc. Alright, so as you can see, we have eight main tracks, and these consist of every layer that I have in my music, except bass, drums, lead vocal, and some keys, and I'll explain why that is in a second. I actually want to play a track to show you how that works. Uh, but we also have some riser effects for transition purposes. And then we have two tracks for the count in. We have one actual metronome setting with uh, a cowbell patch. And then we also have a pre-recorded talkback for cueing purposes. After that, we have some playback commands. So these are actually all stop commands. So I don't have to actually press the space bar to pause the song to do some banter in between. And then at the bottom here, we just have some extra piano tracks. So I accidentally bounced one of the tracks with the pianos too low. So I had just had to double it in the session so that it would actually be heard through the mix and through the monitors of the house. So just a little bit more info on the tracks. Um, obviously I leave the lead vocals out because I have to sing that live. But the reason why I also leave the bass and drums out and the reason why I actually have real musicians playing those is because in live music settings, in most live music settings actually, um, and this is especially true in jazz fusion, even though they are actually playing a part, the bass and drums are actually the most improvised instruments throughout the whole show. This is a stylistic choice and it also gets rid of what I call the karaoke factor when uh, playing live music with backing tracks. It just provides a more impressive experience and that's just my opinion, so. That's how I run my show. All right, so here's an example of how these backing tracks sound. 
So as you can see here, we have some backing vocals. So as you can hear, we have the backing vocals, we have synths, we have pads, we have Roland D50s, strings that obviously cannot be on the stage, and also hits as well. Here, let me go to a part with hits. Uh, this, is my, this is my favorite part right here. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole song. So those are all hits there. This is actually one of the songs where I do a, a pretty big keyboard solo. And uh, I'll, I'll just play the clip right here just so you can see how it sounds with all the instruments. So that was an example of one of the more busier tracks. Now I'm going to show you what I was talking about with the pianos earlier about how I have some of the pianos cut out and I leave some of them in. So the thought process behind that was I actually wanted to have moments where I do play the piano normally, but also I wanted to have moments where I step out and kind of do some crowd work, uh, move around the stage a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this track in the middle because the, at the beginnings there's actually nothing. So um, I'm just gonna let this play and you'll see the only thing that comes in is the backing vocals. So right here and then This is my cover of Ceilings, by the way. Water. So as you can see, there's the backing vocals, and then in a second the strings are kind of come in. Around like... There. Yep. So these are all the parts that don't get covered. And we're just going to let this play, and you'll see where I actually put the piano back in. So I'm playing live here. And there's the piano. So that's when I would stop playing and then I would walk out and kind of sing in front of the stage with the mic in my hand and everything. Another thing that's cool in this song is I actually layer the lead vocal just to get a, a different kind of effect. And also because I'm doing this part uh, in my head voice, which is not as strong as my chest voice. so. Having this extra layer actually helps me out when I'm singing live. It leaves uh, less room for error, uh, but I'm still singing live in the end. So I'm just going to play how that sounds in a second. It's right here. But it's over. Then you're driving me home. So I'm doubling this live. As I get up to go, you kiss me in the car. Just like that, pretty much. And it's fully arranged. Hits. Oh, I love this arrangement, it's so good. So the piano's playing here. And I actually dropped the piano out because now I'm, I'm actually back in front of the piano playing the rest of this part live. And so now the only thing that's playing here is the string parts and then I have a guitar in the background doing some nice like kind of finger picking stuff. Ooh, and that's, uh, I just realized it's clipping a little bit. But yeah, so that's just kind of like a brief overview about how the backing tracks are set up and how they work. And all eight of these tracks are routed to, uh, outputs one and two, so they're going out stereo. So that's why we have those in the two DI boxes. We're actually routing those to two separate channels on the board so that they get a wide, kind of the similar way if you were listening to a stereo mix like on your headphones, like a studio version. As far as the transitions go, we actually don't do too many uh, risers, but here's the one that uh, is kind of like most prevalent in the show. So that's how we do it. And then the tempo changes and everything as well. It's pretty cool. All right, so now for the click. So the way that this is set up, like I said, we have the cowbell track here and then we have the talk back. So not only do we have this routed to output three, as you can see right here, but we're also routing it to a bus on a pre-fader setting because when you turn up the monitor on the interface, specifically the Scarlet, that only applies to output one and two. So it's not going to apply to output three. You need a separate app for that, for the focus right line. 
So with this, we can actually control the volume of the click and how loud it is. So if the engineer actually asks if he could get more gain on the click, we can just turn it up through the session and then it would be loud enough and it would be fine. All right, so I'm actually gonna take both of these off of output three, just so you can hear how uh, these are actually working with the track. So the audio without the click is what the audience hears through the house. But with the click, and you'll see this in a sec as well, let me do the drastic tempo change as well. So this is the end of the first song. So you can hear the click going as well. On and on. So there's a talk back. And there's the tempo change cued. So this is what we hear in our ears once again. And then we start playing there. I should really have a cue for that as well, but we rehearse, so it's all good. There's the hits and everything. By the way, when I say we, I'm talking about my band, which is the three of us. It's uh, bass, drums, and keys slash lead vocal which is obviously what I'm doing. And here's another example regarding how the click really helps us during this show. So during our cover of Human Nature, there's this big uh, 30 second pause that happens in between. So obviously the audience is gonna hear this. Let me just skip to the right part. So the audience is gonna hear this. And then we're all frozen for 30 seconds. This is kind of drastic, so bear, bear with me. So, yeah, it's pretty long, and obviously we can't all count together at that capacity, so this is where the click actually comes in handy. So not only do I have the click going here, but I also have the talk back giving us the downbeat of the next bar so we know where we are. This is an eight bar pause, by the way. And also, if you're ever gonna do this version of human nature, do not do it for this long. I learned this the hard way. And the reason is because the only person that is able to make a pause this long and still have people cheering when it happens is Michael Jackson, so I had a lot of silence when this part happened, unfortunately, but it was still cool. I didn't mind it. Anyway, this is what it sounds like with a click. And I'll sing the next part. So I'll actually come in on bar seven. So we're paused, we're all frozen, like our, our pauses, like our sacred pause. Pose, not pause. Right, here, here do I come in. Seven. Into the morning. So, and here's a clip of that with all the instruments. Into the morning. City's heart begins to be. So also here's how the stop commands work too. So I want to show you how this happens. Let me backtrack a little bit here to ceilings so that uh, I show you how exactly the pauses work. So the click is going here. And then there's a big hit that's right here. And I'm still playing here. I'm still playing live. And I just do it without the click because I want to slow down gradually at my own pace without having to use the click as a crutch. So as you can see here, uh, when the actual marker hits this uh, command, it stops right there, so I don't actually have to pause it manually. And this really helps when I really want to have like kind of a slow moment on the piano that kind of finishes out the song kind of really beautiful. Um, you know, slow down into it properly and everything. And same thing if I want to do banter as well. Um, here's the end of the backing track for running. And then, boom, then we pause, I take a break, take a breather. Cause I'm, and I say like, uh, man, I'm like out of breath after that one, you know, just some cheesy, some cheesy shit. Cause I'm kind of bad at banner low key, but all right. So here's how you actually program these playback commands. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new track and we're going to create a software instrument track, but we're going to do it on an empty channel strip. So we're going to have that set up 
And as you can see, we'll have instrument one right here. And then using uh, the pencil tool, which you can select up here, we're gonna create and we're gonna do command and then create, and it's gonna create a MIDI region for us. Okay, and then we can kind of put it wherever we want. And I've already done this so many times, but so then after that, we're gonna go up here to this little hamburger stack and we're gonna create, see where it says notes here? We're gonna switch this to meta events and we're gonna hit create meta event. And as you can see, we still have this MIDI region highlighted. So once we create this, it's automatically going to assign to this MIDI region. So once we do that, we're gonna go over here to number and these are all the meta events that Logic kind of offers. A lot of these apply to notation, but in this case, we wanna have a playback control. So for this one, we're gonna assign number 52, which is the stop playback. And it's essentially going to do what I just demonstrated with my already existing meta events. Now, when I put this wherever I want on the session, I can move it around. And once the marker hits this MIDI region, it will stop the playback immediately. So as you can see right there, it stopped where it was supposed to. And yeah, works great. You can also assign um, different meta events to these commands regarding uh, routing to the next track. I haven't really done that in this session. If you want to see more about how you can kind of map your session out with these commands, uh, I recommend uh, checking out this video by Nils Jipner, who I actually watched to figure out how to do this. He makes a very coherent tutorial on it, and actually he does a similar rig setup that I just demonstrated as well. I will link that series below in my description if you want to check it out. So speaking of mapping, I actually forgot to mention all the tempo automation that I did for this session. So as you can see, uh, if I drop down this menu here, and I kind of already did, I kind of gave it away, but I have all of this, all of this is regarding tempo. So if I open it a little further, as you can see, I have all the tempos for all my songs at their studio tempos in which they were recorded. So we have Ghost in at 125, on and on at 195. Ceilings is at, uh, what is this? This is, it says 180, but it's, um, <laughs> it says 180, but it's really like, Might be 60 or six. Uh, actually, it'd probably be 60 because it's a, it's a division of three. That's the one thing about Logic is that when you want to do something in compound meter like 6 8 or 12 8 or 9 8, it doesn't really change the value of the beat. It kind of just always assumes that it's the tempo of the quarter note. This is actually 6 4, so technically this is correct, but that's just my experience with using compound meter in Logic Pro X. I don't even know why I said that. 93, 108, 102. So you see, we have a lot of different uh, tempo markings. And then also, if you look closely here, we actually have uh, multiple retardandos and rollentandos into the other song. So let me show you how these play out. and then we hold out the chord there. So as you can see, I kind of had to dictate this with the click because um, I wanted to create kind of a real feeling of like a, like a gospel-y kind of like uh, ending. And uh, I wanted to make kind of an authentic slowdown. So I actually had to input this manually and it's a little bit harder to do with tracks, but um, you know, you kind of just have to make it work. And so that's the first one. Then the other one is in uh, my cover, Free Fallen. Check this out. Free numb, free I kind of went a little far. Gonna cues in the slowdown right here. So there are a lot of tempo changes in this, but it's all for good measure, you know? And also, by the way, I know the click is kind of quiet right now because you can barely even hear the count in, but that's just because uh, in previous experience, when we would plug it into a mixing console, it would be too overpowering and the engineers would ask us to turn it down. So that's why it's already so low because we mix it separately anyway. So it doesn't even matter how loud it is in the session. And then last but not least, here are these uh, extra piano tracks. So if I mute these, you'll actually be able to notice that 
uh, the piano isn't loud enough in this track, uh, my track Gone, which is kind of piano based. So check this out. Actually, there's no piano there anyway, so check this out. There's only piano when it comes in right here. So it gets kind of buried by the backing vocals and the guitars and all the leads and everything. So I had to increase the volume somehow. But since I had already bounced it, I couldn't... Um, get my work back because I actually didn't even save the track. I kind of just did it in the original session and I, I prayed for the best. So that was a bit of a dumb move on my part. But I was able to fix it by uh, doubling the tracks and therefore it just added more volume anyway. So it, it's these are actually the exact tracks on the record. So as you can see here, I also added in a part that I didn't have in there before because I had realized that I wanted to step out earlier. So as you can hear now, uh, the piano is much more present and you can hear it more clearly in the mix as well. And especially when it gets to a part like this, You know, if I, and if I mute these, very much a difference there in volume. So wanted that to be there, much more present. So yeah, this is a pretty kind of well thought out and organized process in this session. And I kind of just run everything myself. I don't have anyone else doing it because I know my show the best. Um, I'm eventually going to get to a point where I can train someone to hit the space bar for me and know exactly where I want the cues, but uh, right now to save money and also just for continuity, I've just been doing it myself. So yeah, that's just a pretty simple rundown about how my backing track setup works and how my session works. Um, so just remember too, uh, everything is going into the stereo output minus the click. That one is gonna go out to output three and um, I actually lost output three because I'm actually running this through a Scarlett 2i2, which only has two outputs. But when you plug in an interface with more than uh, four outputs, it'll show output three and four as well. So also the reason why I'm doing a manual click with the cowbell patch and the count in, uh, as opposed to the logic click up here is because when you enable the logic click, it actually bleeds through the front of house speakers, no matter what output you select it to. So you can go to metronome settings and you select what output you want it to go to, you say three and four, right? And I've tested this on my own PA system and in other venues PA systems. It somehow just doesn't route correctly and it bleeds through. So the point I'm trying to make is you don't want anybody hearing your click in front of house. That would be really bad. Like imagine you're doing this big human nature pause and then all of a sudden you just hear this random voice and this random cowbell. One, two, three. Totally would ruin the performance. All right, so before I move on, I just wanna provide a couple of key things to remember about this type of backing track system. So in order for this to actually work properly, you have to make sure that all the backing tracks are mastered. I actually, once I took out the tracks that I needed, I ran all of these tracks through Ozone and just did a little bit of a limiting situation. I kind of uh, messed it up a little bit here because you see the waveforms are a little bit smaller on this track, but I just increased the volume for that purpose anyway. What I'm trying to say is that you want to make sure that you have consistency in the volumes of the track and the gains of the track because you don't want to have any volume discrepancy when you're playing live because ultimately the engineer is going to have to deal with that and most likely they won't want to. So just for the sake of safety, always master your backing tracks, and which by the way, it's a different process than mastering the actual studio mixes with the drums and bass. Uh, since those elements are missing, you have to account for those when 
uh, specifically EQing. If you look here, I actually have some EQ settings on uh, some of the tracks here as well. I have one of the master. Uh, I just have a little bit of a high cut just because some of the high frequencies are a little harsh when playing this back. And in one of them, uh, I use synth bass. And I had a sound engineer one time say, hey, so the low frequencies of that synth bass are actually hurting our speakers. So you want to do a cut at around 35 hertz. Just put a bell there and decrease the gain a little bit and it should be fine for other systems. And that's exactly what I did here and I haven't had an issue or a complaint since. And also I have the click and the talk back EQ'd so that the high frequencies are really shining through because that's what the in-ears and especially regarding in-ears that only have one driver like the Shure 215s, that's what they're going to pick up the most compared to like bass frequencies and such. But yeah, just make sure that you have all the volumes of your tracks in order. And you can actually test this out a couple different ways. Um, the first time I tested this out on my studio monitors, which I use Kali LP6s. And just for the sake of getting the feel right for the live shows, I actually tested it on my personal PA that I have in my studio. If you don't have a PA like me, you can also ask a venue if you can use their PA system, which might often have like bigger speakers, which is kind of what you will be dealing with in smaller venues. You can ask them if you can test your backing tracks to see how they sound, and then you can make adjustments based on that as well. So anyway, that's how you make a backing track rig. It's pretty simple. It might seem complicated, but actually it's really more just tedious because of all the routing and everything. But ultimately, this provides a better performing experience for your band members because not only will they be able to hear themselves more properly, but they will also be able to be tighter when it comes to keeping tempo. And then that translates from the stage to the audience and then everybody's happy. All right, so as you can see, it is the next day. I'm actually freshly showered. So I actually left out a few important details that kind of come with bringing a system like this to a gig. And this can be seen as a little lesson in professionalism, especially if you're in your early 20s and you're an artist that's just starting out and trying to play gigs and whatnot. So you always wanna make sure that you are extra prepared when dealing with an operation like this because it does take a lot of time. And especially since you are asking for assistance from the engineer at the venue, then that's gonna also require some detail work that you need to communicate with them. So being extra prepared means getting to the gig not just on time, but also getting there three hours early so that you have enough time to set up and then explain to the engineer how it works and then debrief after. And also you just have to remember to keep a level head and try not to panic and get nervous about everything because if you're making yourself nervous, then chances are you are also making other people nervous and then the system is not gonna work the way you want it to and then inevitably the show won't go the way you want it to. So always remember to keep a level head and also this means being super respectful to the engineer and super helpful as well because chances are they don't deal with stuff like this every day so you might have to help them out a little bit to set it up. I actually have a Google Doc up right now that I actually give to whoever's doing sound that night and it provides the gear that we use and the gear that we need from the venue, um, instructions on how to mix the in-ears and how to set our mixes before adjustments, and then how to mix the backing tracks with the band as well. This way that after you do explain it to them in person, that they'll be able to use this as a reference just in case they still don't know what's going on, which sometimes is the case. And just to expand on that as well, um, the reality of being a musician that organizes your own shows, especially in a city like New York City or Los Angeles or whatever, no matter how much you prepare for things to not go wrong, something is still going to not go the way you want it to the day of the show. And even with the engineer situation, uh, no matter how hard you try to be helpful and respectful, sometimes you just get people who don't know what they're doing, are kind of crabby, just all different types of personalities. So always keep in mind that that could be a factor when sound checking the system as well. And also you could show up three hours before the gig starts 
but then the engineer will show up an hour before the gig starts and then you'll still be scrambling to set the system up. So you always have to be ready for everything and just be ready to adapt to any situation that might go wrong the day of. Luckily, there's nothing necessarily too complicated about the way the rack system is set up. It's kind of just as if you're plugging in three extra microphones and then you have two extra monitors that you need to plug into the board. And most venues will be able to accommodate you for that. But sometimes, you know, the engineers will say on the day of the gig, oh, our board is not capable of having other monitors or our room is mono, so we can't put your tracks in stereo. And there are other fixes to this as well with mic splitters and rack mixers, or which I like to call iPad mixers. And those setups are used in typically more high-end rack unit systems and bands who play festivals and bigger venues will have this setup just to ensure the safety of the logistics before performing. If you wanna learn about how to build one of those systems, uh, if you haven't seen it already, Adam Mealy makes a great video about it. I will also link that in the description. And this whole video is kind of just explaining the budget friendly way to do it. So yeah, it, it is tricky to build one of these systems for under $4,000, but it's not impossible. And once again, this is the total price of every item that I've shown you in this video to build one of these systems. So anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it helped a little bit. And yeah, let me know if you guys wanna see any more of these DIY gigging musician tutorials.